welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q. And they coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi the Man, Tobia Singer. Welcome back. How are you, sir? <laughs> all right. Now everybody can relax. I'm here, and we're all good. <laughs> okay. Very good. What I was wondering what happened there. It's like we, we were actually on the phone, and then it just and then it just lost you there. So. Hi, Mom. How are you doing? I'm kidding. Oh. Okay. So, we're all good. Okay. All right. Real very, good. very good. Very good. Well, welcome, Rabbi. Welcome, everybody. Well, Thank you all. It's a big pleasure to have me on. Of course it is. <laughs> This is a big, big deal for you. And um, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. Sure. Um, so uh, coming up in July, there's some amazing events that are happening in the United States. I'm leaving for um, America in July. I'll be speaking in Dallas July 9th and 10th. Uh, and I encourage you to go to Bainenu's website for this. And I'm going to... I just want to make sure I give, mm. provide the correct link. I'll put uh, it in chat. I'll and the chat. correct link is b e y n e y n u dot com. If you go on beinenu dot com, b e y n e y n u dot com, there are two exciting events coming up. So the first one is Dallas. I know you're going to be there, William. Yes, sir. Very, very excited about seeing you. Thank you. Likewise. Um, and so that's July um, July 9th and 10th. And you could see that those series of events that are going to take place in, in the Lone Star State. And the following week, the following Sunday, July 17th, I'm looking forward to a, an exciting event, a debate uh, with... R.L. Salberg um, in Nashville, Tennessee. And that'll be Sunday evening, July 17th. And you can go on to Beinenu.com's website. Again, B-N-E-Y-N-U. Excuse me, change that. B-E-Y-N-E-Y-N-U.com. And so the two dates are, number one, July 9th, and 10th in Dallas, but you got to like sign up for these things. And the other is uh, July 17th, and that's the debate in Nashville, Tennessee. So that's really exciting. Looking forward to all that. And, uh, do go to the Benenu site for that. It is in the chat, by the way, benenu.com. So oh, just good. Copy and paste oh. that into your URL if it doesn't open for you. So, oh. yep, that will work. So it's like, you know, now that like, I don't know, Corona's done with. Yep. Thankfully. And hopefully this monkeypox thing won't do anything weird. Is there really a monkeypox? <laughs> oh my gosh, it wouldn't surprise Yeah, me. there's some other weird thing. I but uh, things are good. I actually went to the pharmacy today. Didn't have to wear a mask. It's nice. exciting. Burger gym. That's good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and move on to this first call. Uh, call your live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, this is Eric from Grand Rapids. Um, question for you. I, I saw a video, an older video, um, where uh, Eli told you Singer is talking about Ezekiel, um, I, don't know, I think it's 21, 18, 23, but it's about repentance and turning away from your sin. And I believe that is taught by Jesus in the form of the parable of the prodigal son. Oh, sorry about that, guys. Um, the, I'm curious about his opinion on that, if he, if he sees that in that too, but that, I do see that in that parable. Um, thank you. Bless you both. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, Bye. very good. Awesome. Go ahead and hang up now to your answer. Rabbi, go ahead. That is an interesting question. We've been what doing this almost eight years now, and right. I, I've waited a long time for someone to ask about the parable, the prodigal son, which is found in Luke chapter 15, verse 11, right through the end of the chapter, verse through verse 32. And the question is, doesn't the parable that comes into view in the book of Luke Luke 15 has a number of parables in it, but this is the final and certainly the most famous of all. And it's unique to Luke. Isn't that consistent with Ezekiel? And it's Ezekiel chapter 18. You're referring to chapter 21 through 23. Um, background, or else people are going to find this difficult to understand. Ezekiel 18 conveys a message found in Tanakh very clearly 
that the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked, and then what hope is there for the wicked person? What hope do you have? If someone innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked, then what hope do you have? You who have sinned, what do you do with your sin? Now, we know what the church would say. We know what the Vatican would say. We know what Paul would say. We know what they would say if you ask the students of Dallas Theological Seminary. We know what they tell you at Fuller Theological Seminary. We know what they would tell you at the Philadelphia College of Bible. But the question is, what does Rabbi Ezekiel say? Like, what does Moses say? Those are our rabbis. So the Navi says, the prophet says that, in fact, the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked. And as for the wicked person, if he will turn away from his sinful ways, repent of his sins, God will forgive. His sins will no longer be remembered against him because of his new life. And then God cries out, is it my desire at all to punish the wicked man? Is it not rather that he turn from his sinful ways that he might live? So Ezekiel 18 explicitly and exquisitely conveys the principle that God is filled with mercy and he will forgive you, although you may not feel worthy of his forgiveness. God is a Rahman. God is completely merciful. This does not jive at all with the teachings of the church. Now, the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. As it turns out, the parable the, of the putative parable of Jesus in Luke chapter 15 is not only consistent with the Hebrew Bible, it is thoroughly anti-Christian utterly opposes the teachings of Paul. And this is what people miss, but this is what makes these parables so attractive. And, you know, we had a call a few weeks ago about the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon of the Mount. And one of the things I illustrated is that the Lord's Prayer, not only not problematic, it's only a problem for Pauline theology. So let me tell you about the parable of the prodigal son. It's the last of three parables found in this chapter. Story. We are told a man has two sons. The younger son asks his father for his inheritance now. He wants his father to divide his estate now. Give it to me now. He's impetuous. And we're going to see he's wasteful. That's what the word prodigal comes from. He receives the estate that he's entitled to, and then he moves off to a faraway place and takes the money and engages in all sorts of sin, prostitutes. His life is just filled with iniquity. With iniquity. And where, where does that leave him? Nowhere. All the money is gone. He spent all the inheritance, and now he's in a faraway land hungry. He finds a job working for someone, a citizen who he had to care for and feed pigs, and he was starving. He even craved the food that the pigs were eating. And then he began to think to himself, what have I done? And he, he becomes filled with remorse for his sin and for his wasteful life, hence the word prodigal. And he thinks to himself, you know, my father has many servants who they could feed me much better than what I can have here. Perhaps I can go back to my father. Maybe he won't recognize me. I, I look so different now. Maybe I can be hired to work for my father. Maybe he won't know that I'm even his son. And get a job as one of his servants. Certainly I'd be doing so much better than I am now filled with remorse, humbly he comes back to his father's house, his head down. His father, in the meantime, is watching, and from a distance he sees his son, his younger son, coming back. And father becomes so excited, he runs out to greet his son, kisses him, and welcomes him with his arms around him, and rejoices. And the son asks him, 
I don't even deserve to be called your son. Look at what I've done. And the father is so filled with joy. You've come back. You're alive. You're not dead anymore, but you're alive. You've come back to me. And throw and and celebrates this. Takes a calf and 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 has it slaughtered and has a whole celebration to devoted to the return of his son. That his son had repented and come back, and the father now considers him his son. The son feels unworthy, but the father says, "Oh, I'm so glad you're back." And there's great music and celebration. Because the son has come back and the father, of course, has forgiven, forgiven him. The, the parable goes on where the older son, he like kind of hears what's going on in the back. Like he, there's music, like what, what's going on here? Like wh- where is this? This sounds like a party going on. Is there a banquet going on? Like what's, and he begins to inquire, like what's happening here? And he's told the story. And he is infuriated. And he says to his dad, you know, all these years I was just completely loyal to you. I didn't I didn't get a goat from you. Like I didn't get any of this. Like why are you showing all this love for the son who was unfaithful to you, who was not loyal to you? And of course the father replies back that in fact he was dead, but he's come back. He has returned. I'm paraphrasing it, but he's repented of his iniquity. He's changed. And now he's back as my son. This is a a very moving parable and it's thoroughly anti-Christian. And it's anti-Christian because in Christian theology, this would be completely impossible. Christians typically have some knowledge of the stories conveyed in the Gospels and the parables in the Gospels are fairly well known, and Christians are far more familiar with these kinds of stories than they are with the theology conveyed in the letters of Paul. The letters of Paul essentially are exactly what the Gospels are not. The letters of Paul are filled with theology. There's almost, there's virtually no sayings of Jesus in any of the 13 putative letters of Paul. There's nothing about his life, ministry, nothing. Pure theology. Paul in these letters is essentially arguing with fellow Christians over doctrine. You can understand why people are far less um, studied on Paul's teachings. The Gospels, conversely, have some theology, but it's basically storytelling and these kinds of parables. And, and then Luke 15 has contains three parables that are similar in tone, but this one really stands out. But the key point is Christians never stop and think about this. Christians will tell you that you can't just say, I'm sorry, and just feel contrite, confess your sins, and turn back to God, and God's through his mercy, he will forgive you. The church will tell you, you need a mediator. And that mediator is Jesus Christ. And we're told that in the letter of Paul. He is the mediator. You need a high priest, and that high priest is Jesus Christ. I didn't make that up. The book of Hebrews conveys that. In the book of Romans, it's very clear that nothing you can do, there's no act of contrition, there's no effort of yours, there's no initiative of yours, there is no work, there is nothing you can do to be saved. You can't save yourself. There's no works of your own that could possibly rescue you from iniquity. Look, if what I'm saying to you seems odd, seems strange, seems alien, means you've never been to a church in your life because this is standard fare. This is every Sunday, every Bible class is filled with this message. There's nothing you can do to achieve your own salvation. Man is utterly depraved, totally depraved. Total depravity doesn't mean what it sounds like, that like man can't do anything good, but total depravity means that there is no initiative of man 
that can bring about his own salvation. There's nothing man can do to save himself. Now, this is incomplete. This is like going to war against the God of Israel. Because in that case, what happened in the book of Jonah is theologically impossible. A prophet, a reluctant prophet, is called to the to rebuke and tell the people of the capital of Assyria, Nineveh, that they are filled with sin. And their city is going to be destroyed in 40 days. And they repent. And God forgives them. See Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. In Pauline theology, in the theology of the Southern Baptist Church, in the theology of the uh, of, of the assemblies of God. It doesn't make a difference. This is utterly impossible. It doesn't make make a difference if you believe in Reformed theology, if you're a Calvinist, or you reject Calvinism. This is utterly impossible. It's only the cross that can save you. It's only the blood that can save you. It is only Calvary that can save you. It's only Golgotha that can save you. It's only the blood of the Son that can save you. It's only that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's the foundation of the church. And the parable of the prodigal son completely opposes that. And that's why people genuinely like that parable because it makes sense but it's not consistent with christian teachings so you know this is why i care so deeply about christians because they're deeply attracted to the judaism that's found in the new testament because as i have said it's not that there's nothing true in the new testament but Anything true in the New Testament isn't new, and anything new in the New Testament isn't true. So the story of the prodigal son found at the end of the book of Luke is not only thoroughly Jewish, but is theologically impossible in Christian theology. Here you have the younger son who went and took his inheritance and ran off with the money, spent it on all kinds of sins, prostitutes and lived a, a completely a life filled with iniquity until he had nothing left. And only then he was brought to his knees. It was only his predicament that made him rethink and turn back to God and turn back to heaven. Thinking that he had no hope, maybe he can come back to God and, um, I mean, he could come back to his father. It's a, it's a parable. Maybe he can come back to his father. Maybe his father won't recognize him. And maybe he can just get a job as a worker and do better than he's doing in this other country where he's just feeding pigs. And his father runs out to greet him, kisses him, embraces him, and throws a celebration for him. The story of the prodigal son is thoroughly anti-Christian. If the parable of the prodigal son is theologically coherent, then all of the New Testament collapses. All the letters of Paul collapse. Moreover, it should be said that we would expect, we would anticipate that this sort of parable would find itself comfortably in a book like Luke, because Luke, unlike the other Gospels, does not believe and does not convey vicarious atonement, does not convey the idea, if we look at Luke-Acts, it's a two-volume work essentially, uh, the key of Jesus' death, it's not that Jesus' death is unimportant, it's very important, but the key of Jesus' death is to trigger a person to think about his death and then to repent, and it is the repentance that brings about the forgiveness of sin. It's not vicarious. And it's for that reason that it is so striking that you would have the idea of vicarious atonement expressed explicitly in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, where Jesus is the ransom, so different than the prodigal son, so explicitly in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, essentially the same passage, Jesus our ransom, but there is no parallel for that passage in the book of Luke. Why not? Why is it gone? 
Why did whoever wrote the book of Luke, we don't know who wrote it, whoever wrote it had a different Christology, a completely different Christology, and a Christology where the story of the prodigal son fits very well, is very much at home. In fact, the church was so unhappy with Luke's Christology that it altered, I'm not making this up, the, the Eucharist in Luke, found in Luke 22, because in 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 the other Gospels, it, it's very clear that the bread and the wine were given for you, for your sin. John chapter 6, and so on. But in, in the book of Luke, it wasn't there, and that's why the church had to literally alter chapter 22, verse 19, and completely insert in chapter 22, verse 20. Completely. And by the, you can look it up in any... Christian Bible that has a reasoned annotation that will point this out, will tell you that all the early manuscripts don't have it. So getting back, the story of the prodigal son is completely anti-Christian. If God can forgive you because you have been contrite, you have rethought your life, and you have repented and come came back to your father, your father can't forgive you. No blood, no calvary, no... Passover lamb, no Golgotha, none of that. So the story of the prodigal son is utterly anti-Christian. Thank you so much for that thoughtful question. All right, very good. That's a good topic for sure. Uh, okay, we'll move on to the next caller. A lot of callers. Callers, when you call in, be sure to hang on. Don't hang up. Some of these calls will take 20, 30 minutes, maybe more. So just be patient with us, okay? Got you on caller ID too, so I can try to, I'll keep track of who's calling and when. So if you hang up to try to get in faster, it's just going to push you further down the line. So once you get connected, just stay connected if you don't mind. All right. Call it. You're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Try to get in faster. It's just going to push you further down the line. So once you get connected, And keep your phone you in your ear. <laughs> Color, you're live on the air. Hello? Yes, you're live on the air. How are you? Okay, this, this is Benita. I'm calling from Delray, Ohio. Oh, you sound a little muffled. Could you, you I don't understand. And it's the ones, I think it's 11 and 12, so it's a thousand year period. I don't understand those two verses. I'm sorry, it sounds like you're kind of underwater for some reason. It doesn't sound clear. Oh, well, you're sounding like that to me, too. Is it? That's kind of weird. Okay. Right, I'll try to clean that up. So go ahead. Uh, can you try to restate your question again, please? The the last uh, couple verses of Daniel about oh. the thousand year period, I don't understand those those numbers. If I could have an explanation, please. Okay, Daniel chapter. What chapter was it? Twelve. Chapter twelve. Last few verses of Daniel chapter twelve. Uh, verses eleven and twelve. Verses eleven and twelve. Okay, Rabbi, you clear? Thank yes. you. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. Bye bye. Yes. Okay. So, uh, this is going to be really fast because Daniel chapter 11, 12 are very, the, it's essentially the last three passages of the book of Daniel. And Daniel is, is speaking in a way that is hard to understand. And it's not. Uh, difficult to understand why. In fact, earlier on, God is saying we need to close this book because Daniel is going to give away the time of the end. The 1290 days are probably referring to 1290 years, and it is probably um, conveying the period of time where the Jewish people had a a temple or a tabernacle, first, second temple, and the tabernacle itself. But I will tell you that this is a mysterious text. And um, and in time, please God, we will fully grasp it. But it is difficult. I can't answer you on that. And as it turns out, um, the angel steps in in this book and says, "Seal it closed, lest you give away the time of the end." But I, okay. I, I've prayed about this passage and thought about it a lot. But I don't have a a conclusive answer that I find satisfactory yet. Okay. okay, very good. Thank you for your question. All right, thank you, Rabbi. Okay, uh, next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Caller, you're live on the air. 
All right, moving on. Oh. Color, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. That, there it is. Try it again. You're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hello. Hello. Yes, you're live on the air. Oh, okay, this is Matthew. Um, I was, uh, I had a question. I, 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 hold on. I might have to, um, might have to turn off his video real quick. Hold on. Okay, sure. Yeah, there's a 10 second delay roughly between what you hear and what's actually happening. So if you call in, be sure to keep your phone ready and keep it close to okay. your ear. So. No, I probably can hear you. Matthew, go ahead. You're good. Okay. So in first Samuel 28, um, it seems like, uh, uh, Saul goes to the witch of Andor and I was re and basically he's trying to, uh, uh, bring up, um, she's a necromancer, uh, necromancer. And, um, and so he's trying to bring up Samuel and, um, and so he brings up Samuel, asks him some questions and all that kind of stuff. But I was looking at Luke nine, was it nine thirty one in which the transfiguration of Yeshu and, uh, and in the verse 31, Moshe, the dead soul of Moshe, or the, you know, this, the soul of Moshe is telling Yeshu the future. And for me, that, that uh, was very interesting because I was wondering, is this a, um, a light, if you, if a, maybe a hidden way of putting that, uh, ye this was a type of necromancy because you have Moses speaking to him about the future as, uh, and, you know, and, and, and then, and the, uh, I, I think it was Peter was asking, Hey, uh, let's, uh, build an altar for, uh, for you three. And, and I guess this is, this is the, the time of, uh, the arrival of, uh, the Moshiach. Right. And so, but what, what I'm saying is in this, it, it literally, it ring the bell between first Samuel and, um, and in Luke, and it, I was wondering, is this a type of necromancy? And so I wanted to ask the rabbi that question. Fair enough question. Good question. Go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answer. Okay, thank you, Matt. Okay, thank you very much. You Bye. Never heard that before. That's actually a good point. Right. So that's a very interesting point. So the transfiguration where Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus on a mountain, we don't know where it is, in the presence of some of Jesus' disciples. Peter um, is there and, and so on, and James and John. And um, no, that's not. What's being conveyed in the transfiguration is that Jesus is lifted up and able to encounter the greatest figures of the Jewish people. If it was conveying speaking to the dead, Moses might have been chosen, but Elijah would not because Elijah didn't die. So the purpose of the transfiguration that you find, as you mentioned in Luke chapter 9, what is being conveyed there is Jesus being raised up by encountering on a mountain the greatest figures the greatest prophets of the Jewish people. And his followers are then are able to grasp the greatness of Jesus without actually being able to be there, but to actually stand from a distance. It's kind of like a Moses thing where Moses goes on the mountain and then he departs and goes further and encounters God. So the purpose of the transfiguration that's found in the Synoptic Gospels is to elevate of Jesus' status. It's not in any way to convey that um, the dead have come back to life, because if it were, it would not be, Elijah would not be one of the people. Um, we would, and it, given what I've just said, you can now understand why John doesn't have a transfiguration, whereas the Synoptic Gospels do. Because the purpose of the transfiguration is to elevate Jesus. But John doesn't need that anymore because in the Synoptic Gospels, where you have a, 
a low Christology. In in Mark, you have an adoptionist Christology. In Matthew and Luke, Jesus becomes the Son of God at his conception. But John, Jesus the Logos, he comes from the eternal past. He's quite divine on his own. He's not fully God or equal to God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, but he's way up there. He is part of the creation process, but God is still greater than him. So in John's view, a transfiguration doesn't lift Jesus up because Jesus is way above Moses, way above Elijah. So you wouldn't expect Jesus' birth to be mentioned in the book of John. You don't have it. You would not need John the Baptist, who was no doubt a historical figure, who was baptizing people for the remission of sins, who was a celebrity in the first century, and therefore attaching Jesus to a really well-known figure um, would heighten Jesus' status as far as the Synoptic Gospels are concerned. But if you notice in the book of John, John the Baptist never there's no mention of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. That whole speech that we find in the Synoptic Gospels when Jesus being doesn't exist in the book of John. We wouldn't expect it to because, in a sense, the person who performs the baptism is greater than the one who's being baptized. And now the Synoptics will deal with that issue where John is going to proclaim that someone greater than me. But that's the point. The Synoptic Gospels are using the baptism scene to elevate the status of Jesus. In the exact same way, the transfiguration is used to elevate the status of Jesus. By the time we get to the book of John, it's, it, the book of John doesn't just appear last in the uh, series of Gospels in the New Testament. It, it actually is chronologically very late. So we have a very high Christology. Very high Christology means just a very high view of Jesus' essence, his deity, who he is. It's the highest of all. I mean, we have the prologue in John 1, 1 through 18, where we find nothing remotely resembling that in anywhere else in the Christian Bible. Certainly not in the in the Synoptic Gospels. You you will have not those the language of John 1, 1 through 18 in Paul, but the idea is you can find a high Christology in Paul. Why? We can't go there now. So the answer to your question is that the transfiguration is there to lift up, to raise the status of Jesus, Moses and Elijah. It's not encountering dead people. Or also been Moses and um, somebody else, maybe Alicia, who actually does die. So that's the purpose of it. And it tells us what, why this is valuable to us is that we can then trace how, what Christians thought about Jesus as the first century is unfolding. The Christology is becoming higher and higher. Jesus' status is raised so significantly by the end of the first century when the book of John is written, let's say about 95, at that point we don't need a transfiguration. Rather than being helpful, it actually becomes a problem. Now let's hope that the world will come to know about the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, reject these sort of teachings, and return to worshiping Hashem only. The nation will speak in a Safa Brura, a pure language, Zephaniah 3, verse 9, and we will see the coming of the true Messiah quickly in our time. Thank you for your question. All right, all right. Okay, good deal. Moving on to the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name, where you're calling from. Caller, you're live on the air. <clears throat> Take another caller. <clears throat> caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. That's why now I don't hear anything. Hang on. Let me toggle the setting here. Caller, you are live on the air. Same system. We had a sound issue earlier, and I don't know where it was coming from, but... Uh, the lady who I couldn't hear very well said that uh, said she couldn't hear me very well either, and so I'm not really sure. All right, let's try that one. 
Caller, can you hear me? Hello? Okay. I'm not hearing anything now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably reset my computer. Um, let me see. I'll tell you what, I'm going to do something. I'm going to answer on the other computer for a second. You won't be able to hear this, Rabbi, but I can get the question out. So while you're working on this next question, um, I will be able to uh, um, work on this out, okay? Okay, color you live on the air. Tell us your name, where you're calling from, please. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Ephraim Gabriel. I'm calling from uh, Canada. Oh, welcome, welcome. Yes, thank you. Go ahead with your question. Um, I'm just wondering if the rabbi can answer what, because uh, you're saying that there's no prodigal son mentioned in the Old Testament, and Proverbs thirty, uh, Proverbs chapter thirty, verse one to four does mention. It. Actually, that was the title error. The question was, is it a Jewish story? Okay, but can I ask the rabbi this question? Sure, go right ahead. Rabbi, can you hear him talking? No. Okay, I think the viewers can, but you can't because it's got a weird loop thing. But go ahead, I'll repeat the question. Okay, so my question to the rabbi is, who is this talking about? Uh, Proverbs chapter 30, 1 to 4. Proverbs 30, God. 1 through 4. He's wondering who that's talking who? about. It's kind of a prodigal Ooh. son story sort of a thing in Proverbs 30. Yeah, um, yeah. so if you can ask him that question, and then I can hang up and listen to him as well. Okay, so just to clarify, the question is, who is that talking about in Proverbs 30 that sounds like the prodigal son yes. story? Okay, you got it. Yes, okay. chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 30, verse, verse 1 to 4. Chapter 30, verse 1 through 4. Okay, go ahead and hang up now, thanks. Thank you. You bet. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye. Yeah. All right. Right. So Proverbs 30, that's the second to the last chapter of this remarkable work um, authored by King Solomon um, during the midst of his life. So if you just start out in Proverbs 30, you're not going to know who my son is. As it turns out, the term beneath my son is used that phrase is used more frequently in the book of Proverbs than any other book in Tanakh. I mean, how does Proverbs open? Shema b'ni musar avicha v'al titosh Torah simecha. Listen, my son, musar avicha, to the rebuke or chastisement of your father, and do not, titosh, uh, and don't abandon the teachings of the Torah of, of your mother. So, B'ni, my son, is all over the book of Proverbs. I believe that term comes up, let's say, around 21 times. It's somewhere in that in the area. It's, there's no parallel to it. So by the time we get to Proverbs 30, you know exactly who my son is, and that's, it's not just Israel, but it means those who are the loyal, faithful of God. It's the one, the, the son who has the wisdom, the one who could see the wisdom. Now, the wisdom personified in Proverbs is conveyed in a way that's very unusual. Again, if you read the book of Proverbs, but not starting at chapter 30, but rather starting in chapter 1, so wisdom personified is walking down the street. This is, a, this is a type, this is a piece of wisdom literature that uses language that's unconventional. So my son is the one who is following the teachings of his father and is not rejecting the Torah of the mother starting right from the beginning, right to the end. And do you know who my son is? Like we're now at the end of the story. My dear friends, see, now you understand why people get into a lot of trouble. Because they read Proverbs 30, skip 29 chapters, and think Proverbs 30 is speaking about Jesus. If you do that, like, what is my son's name, if you can tell? If you do that, if you take a 31-chapter book, and skip the first 29 chapters and just start with Proverbs 
30, you're going to find yourself in an enormous amount of trouble. Moreover, Proverbs is using this device to convey the son who has knowledge and wisdom, who didn't abandon the tradition, mean that which has been conveyed by his parents. So we know who my son is. It's conveyed there. The church has a problem, my friends. The church's problem is that when you go to church, if you went to church today, from the moment you walk in to the moment you leave, you are going to hear Jesus from the beginning to the end. It's just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what's going on. If you count, if you had a clicker like counting, you'd be click. If the clicker would just go hundreds of times. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Right. It's all about Jesus. It's all about looking to Jesus. He died for you, doing what Jesus did. It's it, there are there are songs, there are hymns in the church that go like that. When you go to Tanakh, there's no Jesus anywhere. So what the church did is anytime my son is mentioned, it doesn't make a difference that in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, Israel is called God's son. Matthew didn't care. And in Matthew 2, verse 15, he glad, gladly, gleefully misquoted it and said, well, it's talking about Jesus. Really? But the first part of the passage says it's talking about Israel, right? Um, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Israel, God's firstborn son. Angel of the Lord in the book of Exodus chapter 23. Oh, that must be Jesus. Three angels, that must be the Trinity. Need I say more? Joshua chapter 5, an angel of the Lord, that must be Jesus. So what the church has done is it simply inserted Jesus everywhere. So any vague text that talks about my son, capitalize S and pow, there you are. But the church completely, utterly relies on Christians being completely... Um, unaware of the context of these chapters, of the method used by the authors. And Proverbs is unique. It's a piece of wisdom literature that's using unique language. It has almost no parallel anywhere else in Tanakh. And I do concede to you, my friends, if you don't read the first 52 chapters of Isaiah, you're going to think Isaiah 53 is speaking about Jesus. And if you don't read the first 29 chapters of the book of Proverbs, you're going to think that Proverbs 30 is speaking about Jesus. There's only one way out, and that is to know the whole book. In Hebrew, that would help a lot. Thank you for your thoughtful question. Right on. Very well said. Okay, moving on. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Still working on some toggle settings here, so I may have to do the next caller the same way we did the last one if I can't get them to pick up here. Caller, you're live on the air. Yep, let's try that again. Okay, here we go. Okay, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hi. Um, yes, this is Bronca. Hey, welcome, Bronca. Georgia. Welcome back. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this is an interesting question uh, for me. Um, this is about Melchizedek. Okay, Melchizedek, right? And right, and you know, in uh, in the book of Hebrews and the Christian writings, it says he has no father or mother. But um, what I have read uh, from Bereshis from Art Scroll, you know, they they clearly believe that he um, was. This was Shem, and um, so then let, it let, me, on... let me stay let me stay caught up here with you because I'm having to repeat this to Rabbi Singer because uh, he can't hear the phone lines as they come in, but I can, and you guys can, but he can't hear them. So, so he's saying the Christian uh, Christian books teach that Melchizedek had no father or no mother, um, but in Tanakh, uh, right. right? Okay, and then go ahead. What was the rest? Okay. All right, and so um, in the story, you know, where Abraham meets Melchizedek, um, you know, and um, offers him, you know, the 10% or whatever. Right, so she's um, like, whenever so, uh, Melchizedek meets Abraham 
and that whole transition goes on. Okay. Right. And then uh, it says because Melchizedek um, sort of put Abraham, you know, uh, before God, you know, and uh, then it, it says, you know, that Melchizedek is a king of Salem, um, and yet he's a priest. Um, now, is this the type of priest that is just, um, you know, some type of leading position as Rabbi okay, has so mentioned in the past? Let me run with this real fast, Rabbi. Um, so uh, it says that Melchizedek was, it was, he was the king of Salem, but he was also a priest. So I'm guessing the question is, is, is it possible to be both? Because, or what kind of a priest was he if he was actually a king? Is that kind of where we're headed, Raka? Yes, because um, did he offer sacrifices, do we know? And um, they want to say that Jesus, you know, is after the order of Melchizedek, right. a priest so forever. So did Melchizedek offer sacrifices? Because it says that Jesus is the priest, uh, you know, of, of, of Melchizedek. Yeah, I forget how that was worded. Say that last part again. <laughs> He was a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, I think is what it says, right? And yes, okay. and David, King David, uh, there's a you know a passage, um, and I think that was maybe in Psalms 110, where it says King David, you know, um, is also a priest forever. So could he just explain that? Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so it's almost says that, that King David is is a priest forever. So there's a there's a crossover between whether a king and a priest that can actually happen, being that they're supposed to be from different tribes. Um, so that's kind of what right. this is all that is. Okay, very good. Go ahead and hang up, Brock, and you can tune in for your answer. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Bye bye. All right, Raymond. Yeah. All right. So we have to unpack this. I didn't hear the caller, but let's unpack all of this. This is dangerous business when we use the word priest. Because today, conventionally, when we refer to a Jew who's a priest, I am. I'm a direct descendant of Aaron, a Haron. So we think that's the priesthood that comes to mind. And it should, because the, the priesthood, the covenant that God made with a Haron, my great-great-grandfather, is very is very important. As it turns out, there are other priesthoods in Tanakh. The word Kohen means to hold office, Lechahen. And therefore, other people who hold office in the Bible, meaning who are have responsibility in the Bible, are called priests. And therefore, you always have to look at the context. And I'll give you the wildest example of this. We're told explicitly in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18, that the sons of David were in fact priests. Please look it up for yourself. Now, Christian Bibles are not sure what to do with this, and they usually, I don't have them in front of me, but they will very frequently translate that word, they were kohanim, they were priests, not as they translate that word everywhere else, but they will say to hold office or someone who's in charge. Why? Because it gets very confusing to the reader. And this, my friends, is why I tell you that it's so important to be able to read the original language. Even the the leaders of Baal are called Kohanim, Kohane Baal. It doesn't mean that they're priests. So the word priest is used in Tanakh for many different people. And the book of Hebrews, very specifically in Hebrews 5 through 7, exploits this by conflating them somehow. Because the book of Hebrews was written during the time when the second temple stood probably in the year 64, about there, okay? So before the war, but it's, it's, so it's a fairly early book. 
And the temple was an ongoing process, and whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, of course, knew nothing about the Olivet Discourse, knew nothing about Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. And for him, the priesthood in the temple was competition for Jesus. So the author of Hebrews wants to convey that, in fact, Jesus' priesthood is that of Malkitzedek. Who is Malkitzedek? Malkitzedek comes up in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verse 18. Malkitzedek is not a name. It means Malkitzedek is Melech Sedek, which means a just king. That's not his actual name. That's a title. We'll talk about why he's coming to Abraham in a moment. But he is Shem, the son of Noah. You go, how is that possible? Shem was the son of Noah. Noah lived like long before Abraham. Well, if you do the numbers, you'll discover that Shem lived so long that he was a contemporary of Jacob. And I believe that Jacob was about 50, 60 years old when Shem died. He was the righteous person alive when Abraham was alive. What's the context in Genesis chapter 13 and 14? Abraham rescues his nephew, Lot, from kings, four kings. And he rescued his nephew and received no booty. And the, he took nothing for himself. That was the nature of Abraham. From the moment we're introduced to this great prophet of God, end of Genesis chapter 11, right through, Abraham is never seeking a name for himself. But God in turn says, I'm going to give you such a name that in your name all the families of the world be blessed. Here, Shem, who is called a Melech Tzedek, comes to Abraham and blesses him with wine and bread. He's inaugurated. What does that mean to be a priest? It means l'chahen, to serve, to serve your people, that the torch is going to move through you. It's not an accident that the covenant between the parts is going to unfold in the very next chapter, in the next few words. God then comes to Abraham. That's Genesis 15. And is conveying to Abraham that out of you I'm going to make a great nation. Abraham goes, you must mean Eliezer because I don't have any kids. You're going to have a child. Okay? This is not like a coincidence, my friends. It is true that if your understanding of Tanakh comes from the filter, the theological grid of the book of Hebrews, you're not going to have a shot at this. As it turns out as well, read Genesis chapter 14. The blessing is that you will defeat your enemies. And we see the exact same thing in the book of, in the book of Psalms, chapter 110, one of the most quoted passages in the Christian Bible. What is the blessing to have the priesthood of Malkitzedek? That's not a priesthood of Aaron. That means that God will put your enemies at your feet. You will destroy them. If we want to say that that is the priesthood of the Messiah, great. That is just another proof, just a long list of proofs that Jesus is not the Messiah and he was not a priest according to Malki So It's a very different kind of priesthood than Aharon, than Aaron, the high priest. And Jesus didn't fulfill that. He didn't defeat his enemies. His enemies, we're told in the Christian Bible, defeated him. And he's screaming and crying on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There's nothing remotely resembling that in Genesis chapter 14. It's just the opposite. There's nothing remotely resembling that in Psalm 110. Now, I'm not going to go into Psalm 110, how the church changes Adoni to Lord uppercase L and blows the whole piece. I'm just going to, I don't want to get sidetracked. So here's what we we need to do, because there's a shell game going on here. When we talk about a priest in Tanakh, like who is the priest in Judaism, who is the Kohen in Judaism, conventionally people say it's a, a person 
who is a a descendant of Aaron who has a patrilineal line going back to the brother of Moses. Okay? And I understand why. But in Tanakh, the term priest could be um, it could be an ascription to somebody who holds any position of authority, holding office. And that's where the word Kohen comes from. Lechahen means to hold office, to hold a position of authority. And as I illustrated to you, if you go to Second Samuel, you really need to look this up for yourself, because if you if you don't, you're taking my word for it. And if you're a Christian or or you're not sure where you're going down this path with God, you should be tired of taking a man's word for it, myself included. So what I'm going to ask you to do, if you're Jewish, pay no attention to this. You, you could do it too. But for the, you, the Christian, or you struggling with your faith, I need to talk to you. I need you to stop, stop taking some man's word for it and I'm going to tell you to look it up for yourself. I want you to look up the original Hebrew. You know, even if you don't read Hebrew, you can recognize the shapes of letters. I need you to do that. Your eternity is at stake here. You're not going to be taught this in church. So David's sons were priests. Now, your NIV will translate it differently something like hold office, but go back to the Hebrew. Maybe your Strong's um, numbering of the text would then convey that you use it because everything's at stake. Because if David's sons were kohanim, which it says explicitly, then Hebrews is a liar. You follow? So with the, we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. Whoever wrote it, is exploiting conventional language, is playing a three-card Monty with you. They do that in the streets of New York and London, where a fellow is standing with three cards, and you have to find the ace of spades. And slide, it's this theological sleight of hand. This is a game of hide the ball. This is not honest theology. So if someone says to you, well, there's only one priesthood, but how then... Could Malkizedek, Malkitzedek, be a priest? I mean, isn't the, well, the answer is the, the author of Hebrews and the church, therefore, is exploiting this convention in order to convey a grotesque theology. Malkitzedek is not someone's name, it's a title. It means right, a just king. Melech Tzedek, that's all it means. That means the name of that person, not Malkitzedek. And that's why his parents are not introduced, not interested in that. The key is that Abraham has the torch. And it is for that reason that immediately following Genesis chapter 14, we go into the covenant of chapter 15, God's promise to Abraham. But he first had to defeat the four kings and do it without any ulterior motive. Very much like marrying a woman like Sarai, who couldn't even bear children, no personal incentive for his own progeny. He had no hope. And Abraham expresses that. Please do, please, if you care about the God of Israel, and apparently that's why you're watching this show, please see what the blessing consists of. Please do. Please read Genesis 14, the context. What's the blessing? Defeating your enemies, that's the blessing of this priesthood. The blood, the excuse me, the wine and the bread, which the church will then use to convey the Eucharist. But the blessing, both in Psalm 110, Psalm 110 is like a really short chapter, is that you will defeat your enemies. So if this is somehow talking about the Messiah, that's exactly what Jesus didn't do. Oh, I'll do it in a second coming. Well, then anybody could be the Messiah. That is the red flag that's the hallmark of a false messiah one who didn't do it now but somehow will do it in the future don't be you have to be very careful because when you hear the word priest you go oh you know just like when you hear the word anointed right mashiach you go well that must be the messiah non tanakh and that's what you're going to get yourself a whole bunch of trouble in daniel 9. 
when you hear the word priest, well, that must mean a descendant of Abraham. It can't be. Abraham lived long before Aaron. Okay, so go back to the original text, look it up for yourself, and look up 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18. Go back to the original Hebrew where it says that David's children were priests. And then take your New Testament and return it for a full refund. Thank you for your question. All right, excellent. All right, we're going to try to take this caller. You are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Caller, you're live on the air. Okay. Yeah, I still can't figure this out. I've already reset the system. I may have to call Ring Central and get some tech support. So I'm going to give you a question real fast, Rabbi, that uh, someone had passed on to me that I cannot really answer effectively like you would be able to. Uh, basically, the question was, how did you decide the Hebrew Bible is truth? When I found out Christianity is not real, I've tried to debunk every other religion, including Judaism. So far, uh, Judaism is the only one I cannot debunk uh, and actually find historical proof. But since I have been in a false religion for so long, I'm afraid to trust my senses or my intellect at this point. Very true. And Hashem should have mercy on you and watch over you. Jewish people have no idea what Christians go through when they're confronted with this information. Jewish people have no understanding of the amount of fortitude required for a Christian to reconsider his faith. Uh, for a Christian, you read the Gospels and the stories are so gripping. And the stories are filled with the good guy, Jesus, and the bad guys, the Jews. Every one of the stories goes that way. The bad guy and the Gentiles who are just simpletons. And any rational person reading the Gospels, if you've never read Tanakh, is going to go, whoa, the Jews are really, really bad people. It really, you who are, who are a Christian that has views about the Jews that are, un, that are uncharitable, that are not flattering, there's nothing wrong with you. You've read the text, a natural reading. So when Christians are confronted with compelling information, where they're, they realize they have been lied to because they're looking it up for themselves, not because I possess any kind of charisma, not because I have this remarkable communication skill. It's always look it up for yourself. The, the world collapses beneath them. It is very difficult. Hashem should only have mercy on you. Because for many Christians, it's not like, okay, I guess Jesus is not the Messiah, and if he's not the Messiah, then God, the faith must revert back to the default baseline, Judaism. It should be that way, but it isn't. And what I mean by that is that if you ask any Christian, it's not a pleasant question, if you ask any Christian, if Jesus isn't the Messiah, and the New Testament is not the Word of God, and None of that. Then who has the truth? So a Christian would then say that the Jews do, and not any Jews, but particularly, specifically, Pharisaic Jews. If, if, I mean, Paul concedes this. You know, if there's no resurrection, your your faith is in vain. You're still in your sins. First Corinthians 15. It means Judaism is a default baseline. The claim that Jesus is the Messiah is utterly fantastic, and the support for it is a nightmare. But this is not the way Christians are raised. And that's why what I want to do for you is to not get you to be a fan of Rabbi Tovia Singer. That, it's for that reason that whenever I'm asked a question, an email, many of you have received emails from me, thanking you, whatever it is, you notice I, I never sign my name Rabbi Tovia Singer. I never do. Unless it's an official document from the government 
unless I perform the wedding or um, there's something official going on or it's a special mailing. But if you ask me any question, if I thank you for support, whatever it is, it's Tovia. Because I'm trying to wean you away from me. And I'm trying to get you back to the text. I want to empower you. I want to give you back what has been taken from you. The ability to read the Hebrew Bible for itself. Judaism does not rely on Christianity. Orthodox Christianity, lowercase o, completely relies on the Jewish Bible. It claims so. It says so. Going right back to the um, to the canonical texts, going right back to the Gospels, they all claim that this is a film of the Hebrew Bible. It isn't. And there's a reason why in 1 Corinthians 15, a chapter I quoted a moment ago, quotes phantom verses that don't even exist in the Hebrew Bible. I'm talking about the first four passages of First Corinthians. There is no scripture supporting a resurrection after three days. It doesn't exist. You have been lied to. So I do understand. I didn't, when I started doing this more than 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, I just thought, that, oh, Christians will just find out that they've been lied to and they'll just walk away from it. Well, you know, it's like a stock, you know, like imagine you own shares of a certain stock, right? And somebody who's in a no says, I would, you know, I would get rid of your, this is a good time to sell out Tesla or Bitcoin, whatever. And you, you just get rid of it. You wouldn't have, and you'd be very grateful to get it because you're not really emotionally attached to it. You just want to, your money to make the most amount of money. If you find out it's not going to do that, just sell it, Right. It doesn't work that way. So for you Jewish people, for you people who who don't understand Christians, you, you don't understand why it's so difficult for Christians to let go. Because they love Jesus. That's how Christians are put to bed at night. Jesus loves you. You're going to go to heaven if you believe in Jesus. And if you question Jesus, you question the doctrine of the Trinity, you're going to hell. You're going to burn in hell forever. But Jesus loves you. You've been betrayed, but Jesus will never betray you. So much so, he gave his life for you. What greater example of friendship and loyalty is there than one who's willing to die for you? You know how powerful that is? That's why Christians are Christians. So when Christians are confronted with this information, they have a number of choices. They can say, Rabbi Tovi Singh is like the worst person, and he's lying to you. Or they can go... Let me look this up a little bit more here. And then they look it up. They go to the original Hebrew, which Christians believe is the word of God. And they go, whoa. So turn to Hashem. Pray to him and him alone. Your tongue should praise no one besides the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Him alone should you praise. It's him alone that every knee will bend to. Him alone that the world will bow to. He will be king. You need a lot of help. But Hashem knows that you've been hurt. Read Tanakh and then surrender to the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the, the message of a national revelation. When God conveyed his eternal truths, he did it through an, a national revelation, an unparalleled event and even claim in human history. Why? He wanted the world to know. Any religion that says that that message has changed, it must, the teachings of that religion must be immediately jettisoned. And the church has, has raped the message of the Hebrew Bible. But I know it's hard. I know it's difficult to trust. That's why I always say to you, the viewer, I say, please look it up for yourself. All I can do is show you. I, I can point it to you. But I want to empower you. I want you to read the Hebrew. I recognize that my parents did a remarkable thing for me. They gave me a, 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 a very striking Jewish education. Hebrew is my mother language. And I know that my my friends in the church, they, don't, they didn't have that advantage. That's why I'm always saying, please go back to the original. Please look it up for yourself. Please look up the text for yourself. Um, the text will only bring you to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We revere Abraham, but we would never worship him. That's how the, 
the Hebrew Bible has been shaped. We would never worship a prophet, whereas the Christian Bible is pointing you in a completely different direction. And you will remain in my prayers. Thank you for your thoughtful question. Shalom. Very good. Very good. All right. We'll go ahead and move on. We to have this. time for one more question. Okay. Very good. All right. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello? Yes, you're live on the air. Okay. I'm Paul from Virginia. And my question is, in Genesis 2465, when Abraham's servant was returning on his mission to find a wife for Isaac, when Rebekah saw Isaac walking in the field, it said that she bailed herself. I was curious what this was in that is this a face veil or something customary that they did? Uh, I just didn't know exactly what's going on there. Well, this was a sign of extreme modesty. Right? Rebecca is encountering the man who she is going to spend her life with. So this is a... This is a, 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 a woman who recognizes something remarkable. And Rebecca is not any woman. She was an enormously modest woman. We're, we are told in this same Bible that Rebecca was a virgin. We're told about her, what kind of personality she is, that she was a person so modest that she never knew a man. It says so explicitly. So this is the kind of woman who is enormously virtuous? That's a very good question. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your call. All right. Well, Rabbi, I guess that's going to wrap us up for the day then. Thank you. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn on notifications, and we'll look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. And Rabbi, I just want to hit one more time uh, about our uh, Yo, July, July 9th and 10th. Right. So that's really exciting. So please put up Beinenu.com um, in the chat. Beinenu Got it. contains the events uh, in Dallas. I'll be speaking on both Saturday night at a Texas barbecue. I've heard that term used before. It's hard to tell from my Alabama accent that I'm not from <laughs> Texas. But whatever it is, it's supposed to be very good. I'm actually getting all excited just thinking about that. <laughs> but we're going to be doing Q and A Saturday night. That's going to. And be. you need, but you need to register for that, and you could do that on beinenu.com. And and then on the tenth lecture and Q and A for new audience, that's going to be really exciting. I invite you to join me, but you do need to register for that on beinenu's website, uh, and then. The following Sunday, on July 17th, I'm going to debate uh, Professor R.L. Salberg in Nashville, Tennessee. And I hope you'll join me for that special event. And again, you need to register for it. These are not the things that you just show up and, and, and you need to, need to register all of that stuff beforehand. So please register for Dallas on July 9th and 10th and register for um, Nashville July 17th on Beinenu.com's website. And I know you, I'm, I'm not looking at it now, but I'm, I feel fairly confident sure. you put that up in the... It is in the chat, yes, sir. In the chat yeah, room, yeah. brilliant. Yeah. So there it is right there. Okay. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. We'll see you same time, same place next week. Shalom. Peace out, everybody. Thank you. Shalom, my dear friends. I just want to say thank you all for your support of the channel over the past eight years. Um, many of you don't know, many of you do. I've been recently fired from my job because of this channel. And uh, for the first time, I've actually been put in a situation to where I can take some time and invest towards making Tanakh Talk much better. Better platform, 
uh, more organized, better quality videos, emails, this, you know, much of shared different content, things like that. So if you guys would be willing, please consider donating monthly to help sustain Tanakh Talk and our family so we can keep this thing going and make it better than it ever has been before. Uh, there's going to be some links provided for you in the video description area below the video. Please, if you don't mind, check those out. Greatly appreciate it. Shalom, everybody.